Welcome to chapter 10, section 1A. We're going to talk about thermodynamics now. And specifically today we're going to look at the relationships between heat and work. So what we're going to do is we're going to, you're going to learn to recognize that a system can absorb or release energy as heat for work to be done on or by the system. And also that work done on or by the system can result in the transfer of energy as heat. And then we are going to calculate the amount of work done during a thermodynamic process. This last part where we talk about isovolumetric, isothermal, and adiabatic thermodynamic processes, we will save for a separate video. So I want you guys to think back and remember how we talked about if you take a hammer and you hit a nail, okay, into a block of wood, the friction between the hammer, or excuse me, between the nail and the wood causes it to heat up. So what happens then, remember, is friction is doing work. And that work, okay, that internal energy of the wood and nail will be transferred into the air until they are in thermal equilibrium. So all that heat that's generated by the friction, okay, and let's just kind of summarize this for ourselves. We get friction here because we're hitting the hammer and nail, okay, and that friction does work and that work causes heat, okay, and then that heat is released to the surroundings, and <clears throat> until it reaches thermal equilibrium. So even though heat is generated, that heat is then lost out to the surroundings again. So this is an example. We talked about heat. We talked about work and internal energy here. And this is an example of what we are going to study now, which is called thermodynamics. So anything that involves heat work and internal energy will have thermodynamics. So taking a closer look at this word so we can understand it a little bit better, if we look at the first word here, thermo, okay, in thermodynamics, this first part means having to do with heat or with energy. So we used, in the last chapter, we used thermal, right, because we talked about thermal conduction and thermal insulators, okay? So this therm part, thermo, thermal, that has to do with heat and energy and temperature. The next word, dynamics now. Dynamics tends to have to do with things that are powerful, and often powerful things are moving, okay? So indirectly it tells us that something is moving. So we've got heat or energy, right? And then we've got a word that here that means powerful or moving. And so thermodynamics then, those two words together, is the study of the transfer of work, heat, and internal energy. So thermodynamics has a lot to do with our modern lives, okay? Thermodynamics is how we can look at engines and understand and uh, create them. It is also how our air conditioners work to keep our houses cool, or in the winter, how heaters work to keep our homes or schools warm. Our refrigerators also use thermodynamic principles to cool our food. And really, the entire Earth is one big thermodynamic system because it has to do with how much energy the Earth absorbs versus how much is reflected off, and just the temperature and even the weather of our world. All of these things are within the realm of thermodynamics and involve heat, work, or internal energy transfers. So the first thing we want to look at now is that internal energy can be used to do work. So how would that happen? Well, remember, work is equal to a force times a distance. Okay, so anytime internal energy acts as a force, and causes an object to move, or we'll notice often change volume, it is doing work. Okay, so here this internal energy, remember internal energy refers to all the motion and energy of the particles. So those particles are moving and bouncing around and doing things, right? They're always moving. So because of that, they can cause forces. So let's look at a more specific example. So think about how a hot air balloon works, okay? You start out with essentially a deflated balloon, and they actually just kind of blow some air in there to get some of the volume up. 
But what really controls a hot air balloon then is they actually like light a fire, okay? And so they're adding heat and they heat up the particles inside and that causes the air balloon to expand even more and you can see it rise off of the ground. So what we have done here in this example now is you can see it started out low, right? And then it ends up high. So it went from down here, let me use another color. It went from down here all the way up there. Okay, so we needed some force to cause this, and it caused a movement over a distance, and so we have work. So just to summarize it here, you can see it a little closer with these two pictures. Okay, we start out at this height here. We move it and fill it up until it's this height. The balloon has also expanded. It has gotten bigger, not just lifted up higher off the ground. And again, we have now used heat as a force to cause a displacement or distance, a change, right? And so since we have these together, we get work. Okay. Now the other thing I want to point out here is, like I said, the balloon doesn't just go up higher, it also expands. The volume of the balloon here is smaller than the volume of the balloon here. And so we're going to look specifically at volume changes because volume changes involve displacements. But before we go into too much detail, there's one more word that we've used loosely before. And now we're going to give it a very strict definition, okay, and that is the word system. So whenever we've said system before, we were kind of just talking about a group of things, but we never really defined it. So if we look at what system means, specifically, system is defined as the set of interacting components, and components are just pieces of something, okay, that are considered to be apart and separate from other things. So if we look at this example, okay, here we have a candle, we've got a little bit of the wax, okay, the wick, the flame, and a little bit of the heat here in the immediate surroundings of the air, and we call this whole thing the thermodynamic system, or we'll often just refer to it as system, okay? And then we can always define where some boundary is, so here it has the white lines for you, and then we'd say everything outside of that is the thermodynamic surroundings, and actually your textbook uses the word environment more than surroundings. Environ, let's see if I can spell. There we go, environment, okay? So in general, this system can be any shape, any size. Whenever we just have to create some system boundary, okay? And then this would be our system inside, and then we'd have our environment outside. Okay, so that line does not have to be a circle, it can be any shape whatever we decide it to be. And then we talk about everything within that system. So let's look at another example now. Going back to roller coasters, we've talked about a lot about roller coasters and energy. And so if we take a look at this roller coaster, what could we call the system? Okay. Well, most often we've talked about kinetic energy and potential energy, and then we've talked about the friction between the cars and the, uh, the track. Okay. So we might say that our system, if we listed out the parts of our system, Okay, I'm going to say the system is the track, okay, the whole track, the cars, which includes their wheels, right, and all their parts. And then it's also going to include any people in the cars, okay, or really anything in the cars at all. And then I'm just going to say the immediate air surrounding it, or immediately surrounding air. Immediate. And I say that because some of our friction, right, that, that heat from the friction will go into the air. So a roller coaster is a little hard because I can't, like, circle exactly it. But if I was to roughly outline it just in the picture here, I might say that my system boundary looks something like this. Okay. But it's not always easy to draw a circle. Sometimes we can just list out the parts in our system. So now that we have a better idea of a system, whenever we're talking about things happening in thermodynamics, we're going to be talking about 
as it happens within some defined system. So now we can look at how we can calculate that work that we were talking about, looking at that air, hot air balloon that was rising, okay? If we went back to that, that balloon, it's hard to calculate exactly how much volume is changing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at this system here, okay, where we have a really simple cylinder, okay, and we just have this plate inside that can rise up and down, and it can move so that the volume of our system can change, okay? So here, it used to be down here. It's going to rise up here, okay? And as we do that, we can look at the volume. And then forces on things like this are actually easier to measure in terms of pressure. So what we're going to find out is that since often thermodynamic work involves an expanding substance, work is calculated from pressure and volume. And your book shows this as well, but I just want to show you how that comes about because force force is equal to a pressure times an area, okay? And then it's the distance that changes here. But area times distance is actually just the change in volume because we only care about that distance that it changes. So we're just gonna look at the change in volume. And it turns out we can calculate either by force times distance or by pressure times our change in volume. So I just want to point out two vocabulary words here for you, okay? I said them just a minute ago, but I want to make sure that you know. So here, this thing that I'm outlining in the pink pen, okay, that is called our cylinder. Okay, and we have cylinders in all kinds of engines. And we're going to look at a real one in just a minute, but I want you to become familiar with these words. And this part here, okay, and the plate that can move up and down, that whole thing is called a piston. So we will use these words again and again as we go through the rest of the chapter. So make sure that you become familiar with those two words and what they mean. So just a quick look, this is the inside of a real engine, okay? And see if you can identify where the cylinder is and where the piston is. It may be difficult if you've never seen this, but just try for a moment. Okay, so as we look at this now, Hopefully you noticed that what looks like this piece here, we've got kind of that round plate looking piece. And here the piston is quite thick. This whole thing is part of our piston. And this is the other part of it that allows it, and this actually will go in a circle. Okay, it travels in a circular path. Okay, and this will move up and down in the engine. So this is probably a gasoline engine, right? So the gasoline will be allowed in down here. Then this is the spark plug that ignites it and then it expands, pushing the piston down. Okay. And this area that it's within forms our cylinder. And we can't really see the outside edge of the cylinder, but it goes back there roughly like that and roughly like that. And in a real engine, this would be enclosed all the way around to form an actual shape like the geometric cylinder that it is named after. And so you can see here, it's that movement up and down that causes an engine to move and is what drives your wheels as your car or boat or really anything with an engine moves. So let's look at a practice example now for calculating. So in our example here, we've got a steam engine, okay? So steam moves into the cylinder of a steam engine at a constant pressure and does 0.84 joules of work. So I know that work is 0.84 joules, okay? And does that work on the piston, okay? So just to refresh, basically we have a shape like this. We have a piston here, okay? And the work is being done to move it, okay? <clears throat> so the diameter of the piston, so I'm gonna use I'm going to spell that out, actually, because it's not our distance, and we want to be careful. Our diameter is 1.6 centimeters, and we've always got to convert that to meters. So let's just do that right now, and it'll be 0 0.016 meters. Okay, and the piston travels a distance now. Now we can use D for our distance, 2.1 centimeters, and that will be equal to 0 0.021 meters. So now, what is the pressure of the steam on the piston? So we're going to pull out our equation here. Work equals pressure times our change in volume. 
And now to change in volume, we've got to remember the rest of our equations here that have to do with areas and stuff. So our change in volume is going to be equal to the area, whoops, let's make that an A, the area of our piston times the distance that it travels. So area is pi r squared. And then we're going to multiply that by our distance. So let's go ahead and we can take that now and plug that in over here and solve for our equation. So as I do that, we start with W equals P delta V. So our work, 0.84 joules, will equal our pressure, which is what we're trying to find, times our change in volume, which I can plug all of this in now. So I'm going to have pi times the radius. Remember, radius is half the diameter, so I'm going to say it's 0 0.016 meters divided by 2, and we need to square that, times our distance, and our distance, there it is, 0 0.021 meters. Now when I plug all that in and solve for P, I get 198, excuse me, 198,943.7 newtons per meter squared, and that is my answer. So now I have used our new equation for the work done by a gas being equal to pressure times the change in volume to solve for the pressure of the steam inside of our steam engine. All right. Hopefully you guys have a good understanding now about what thermodynamics is and how we might apply it. And in the next video, we will take a quick look at three specific types of thermodynamic processes. Please remember to ask me any questions you may still have in class, and I will see you there.